Hello everyone and welcome back to Callie's Corner on Unfiltered Gamer. I'm Callie and today we are talking about tips for writing rule books. These tips are based on my experience reading hundreds of rule books, writing and editing a few rule books for board games and card games. As well, I have a master's in English language and literature, and I do a lot of copy editing in my day job as well as a marketer. Rule books are a huge component of your game. For a lot of players, reading the rule book is actually gonna be their first interaction with your game. And having a bad or frustrating experience reading the rule books can be detrimental overall to their experience of the game. So let's write a really strong, really easy to read and understand rule book. My first piece of advice is to follow the structures and conventions of other rule books, especially rule books that are of games that are similar to your own game. I talked a little bit about this in my tips for reading rule books video as well, which will link so you can see that as well. But generally, the games are going to have, rule books are gonna have certain structures. So first the introduction, the objective of the game, the components, the setup of the game, the player turn order, the round turn order, maybe some more detailed sections under there or card sections. And then finally, the end game, so how to win and when the game ends, how to score, as well as some sort of appendix or extra information, quick start guide or variations of the games at the end. Like I said in the tips for reading rule books video, following these conventions is going to help people understand a lot about your game just by reading those uh, overarching sections. So how the length of the game, the depth, the different mechanics, they're gonna get a really good idea of your game and they'll be able to find those sections later when they're playing the game in the middle of playing it a lot easier, whether to reference a specific rule or to look up a certain chart or even just setting up the game. Okay, I know exactly where to go and how many players, this is what the difference in how we need to set it up for this game. Probably the number one thing I see in a lot of rule books that are in progress is obvious things that seem obvious to the game designer but are not obvious to anyone else, to everyone else. And these are things that are easy to overlook because it seems like, yeah, of course you would shuffle the card deck before you deal but it's really not obvious and it needs to be stated, shuffle and then deal. Because there are certain games where you're setting up the deck in a certain way or you want the get cards to be played out in a certain way. Another thing that seems obvious but is often overlooked is who starts the game, who goes next after that, and when or during whose turn does a round end or begin. These are things that are super easy to do when you're demoing or playtesting the game because it's just the facilitator or the game designer saying, it's your turn next, it's your turn next, or here we're gonna do this. But when you're reading those rules as a, without someone demoing the game to you, it can be hard to decipher sometimes exactly who goes when and next. And there's a big difference between uh, enemy actions taking place after each individual's turn or at the end of the round. That can have a huge impact on the experience and balance of the game. Another thing you'll really want to deeply consider is keeping the world building and story separate from the meat of learning the rules. And there's a few reasons that you'll want to do this. One is when someone's reading just to learn the game, we want them to really deeply understand the mechanics and play it correctly. That should be the number one goal. Secondly, when they're teaching the game to others, we want them to easily know where are those components that they could bring into teaching the game that are going to add a little bit of story and world building and get the players excited. So that's why I like to recommend separating those out a little bit, putting some maybe at the introduction. That's a great read aloud to get everyone excited for the game. And at the conclusion, when there may be a certain outcome to the game that you wanna extrapolate. And you can do this a few ways in the design of the board game rulebook, either italicizing that world building text, breaking it out in block quotes, 
or adding it as some description to the different illustrations in your rule book. Another thing to consider when writing the rules is your audience. So your audience is the person who is a typical person likely to read your rule books and they're going to have different reasons for reading and we want to help them achieve those goals. They might be reading to first, of course, learn the rules, understand just the mechanics of how to play and how to explain that to others. Next, maybe they're going to be reading those rules to refresh their memory or to look at a certain type of rule and debate on what should happen at this point in the game. And that's where those sections are really going to come in handy. And thirdly, they may be reading the rules to help set the scene for, for the game and for all the players around the game. Another important element of knowing your audience is understanding how familiar they are with games and with the types of games that you've sort of categorized your game as. And I'll have or I'll have a video about board game categories that would be really helpful as well to be thinking about because that's going to help you understand the level of sort of knowledge of board game terminology that they have and of other games that they might have played that are similar to yours. Speaking of terminology, I suggest using demos and play tests to really test out the words that you want to use in your rule book. This is a great opportunity to see what sticks. In addition, you may notice some players using words that are commonplace in board game terminology, and you may have wanted to use a special word for that card deck, but if it's just an objective deck, an objective card, that's what it is, and that's what your play testers are using and calling that, you might want to just keep it simple, name it the objective card or objective deck. While you do want to keep it simple, these demos and play tests are another way to sort of play with words and see how you can better connect your game mechanics to the theme of your game. So using analogies for some of the mechanics and seeing how you can create that stronger connection, I think that always makes for a really great game experience when the mechanics and themes just work together so well and those analogies that you can test out during the playtesting can help you get there. A lot of what I've been talking about, you may think as a game designer or developer, I could do this on my own, but it is definitely important to have outside sets of eyes look at your rulebook and playtest your rulebook. This is called blind playtesting, where you just send the game off to someone and they play it and get back to you with certain questions and with certain feedback on how the gameplay went and from those questions you'll see what rules they may have gotten incorrect where they needed some clarification and how to make those rules better another level of editing that's going to help is the copy editing the copy editing is where the editor is looking strictly for grammar conciseness and just making sure everything is correct in a readable and understandable way and that's a little bit different from a full in-depth rules editor who's going to really help you define the structure of the rules and make sure that the players are actually playing the game correctly and having a good experience reading the rules and playing the game. Finally, I highly recommend creating player reference cards as part of your board game experience and I consider it part of the rules. And one way you can figure out, well, what's going to make a good reference card for my game is just watching and listening to people during those play tests. What kind of rules do they need clarification on? Are there icons that they keep forgetting what those icons mean? Or do they keep asking, wait, what do I do on my turn? Or how many actions can I take? Those are your clues for what should be on that player reference card. Finally, a little bonus tip that is more just a pet peeve of mine as an editor, and that is capitalizing or creating new proper nouns for everything in your game. I know everyone's game is special. It has a unique world and with a rich history and all of that, but 
pl our players have limited working memory. We want them to have the best experience possible to get into the game, and we want to build on their prior knowledge of what they understand about games and using certain board game terminology or just general terminology is really going to help us do that. For example, in your worker placement game, your workers may be a specific race or have a specific identity, they're Alderaan scientists, but to your players, and this goes back to the tip previous, they just know them as workers and sometimes that's going to be a lot easier to identify right away in their mind that you're talking about the workers. And just one last thing I like to constantly keep in mind as I'm editing rule books is I want to make our players feel smart and capable. I want them to, to get it and just get into playing the game because that's really going to be the best part and hopefully give them a really great experience. Rules are something that if they're well done, your players aren't even going to really think about them. But if they're not done great, if they cause frustration, that's really going to create a bad experience and it's really not going to be fun for anyone. They won't, maybe they won't want to play your game again. They won't talk about it to others or share it with others. And we, we want that. We want to build a great community of players playing games and having fun and sharing those games with others. In my experience, even some published games that we've received, we were reading through the rule books and just couldn't understand it or there was some sort of missing piece of information in there and we just ended up not being able to play the game, which is a real bummer when you spend money to buy that game, you want to play it and it could just create a bad experience. So we want to avoid that. Well, I hope these tips today have helped you think about your rule book in a little bit different way give you some actionable tips that you can incorporate as you're editing your rule book and asking others to help you edit your rule books. If you'd like to, you know, subscribe, that would be much appreciated. Hit that notification bell as well. You'll get notified when we have new videos. Like this video, share it out. It's much appreciated. And if you want to join the Unfiltered Gamer community, even vote on what topics we're going to tackle next in Callie's Corner, please check out our Patreon. We'd love to have you join the community. We have a great tight-knit community of people watching our live streams, contributing on the Patreon, in our Facebook group. Uh, it's awesome. I love them all. <laughs> Please let me know in the comments below, what do you struggle with in board game design? I'd love to know what your questions are, what, what you're thinking, how I could help maybe. I have a lot of experience in the different stages of board game design and promotion as well, from helping students design games, to editing rule books, to creating content and reviewing games. And I'm hoping to do my own Kickstarter soon for Moonshell, a mermaid game, which is my solo, first solo design. And if you want to join that community, please do moonshellgame.com. It's a puzzle strategy game for two to four players and it'll be coming out on Kickstarter this year, 2020. <laughs> this is Callie from <laughs> Callie's Corner at Unfiltered Gamer. And as always, I look forward to seeing you guys next time.